I'm Nicola Pecorelli, I'm from uh, Milan, Italy. I'm uh, one of the chairs of the session. And with, uh, I'm not sure if you can put the slides, but anyways, with Suzanne uh, Warner from, uh, from Mayo, one of the HPB heroines here, we designed uh, a session that is pretty much split uh, in two. The first part of the session will deal with uh, localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and the second part with uh, uh, liver metastasis from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So I'll start off uh, uh, saying that unfortunately, uh, Dr. Partelli was not able to make it. Uh, he had some problems back at home, uh, So, but I'd like to acknowledge him. Uh, he's uh, one uh, of, of my colleagues uh, in Milan, and he's the leader of our neuroendocrine tumor group at San Rafael, uh, and uh, he's the first author of the uh, ENETS uh, guidelines for the surgical management of uh, non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors. So. Let's see if I can find it. Perfect. So I'm going to take on his, uh, his talk on uh, small non-function pancreatic nets. Let me just put this on. <laughs> I'm going to time myself. So I have uh, uh, no disclosures. Okay, we'll start looking a little bit at how things uh, have changed in terms of uh, the incidence of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So you can see that in a few years, the incidence rose from 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 uh, per 100,000 inhabitants. This is population data from uh, the US, and definitely this is related to the amount of cross-sectional imaging uh, finding incidentally uh, neuroendocrine tumors but the actual incidence may be a lot higher. If you take a look at the series that we published uh, a couple years ago in our center, looking at more than 1,000 pancreatic specimens deriving from pancreatic resections for diseases other than pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we found in the pancreatic surgical specimen a 4% rate of small uh, neuroendocrine microadenomas or neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see that the median diameter of these incidental nets was very small, three millimeters. So actually, although the population-based incidence is very low, 0 0.8 out of 100,000, it's possible that the real incidence of these tumors in the population is more around one to 4%. So we can drive that probably the vast majority of the small pancreatic neurotum neuroendocrine tumors will remain in dole through a lifetime. So let's look at what is the proposed management from the well-known uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor society. So in Europe, the uh, 2017 guidelines uh, <clears throat> say that in small, saying less than two centimeter, non-functional, sporadic neuroendocrine tumors, possibly benign tumors, the surgical benefit ratio should be carefully weighed. It's very vague. If you look at the most recent North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society guidelines, it actually differentiates between the small tumors lower than uh, uh, one centimeter in size and the one between one to two centimeters in size, saying that surveillance is adequate for the smaller lesions, while for lesions between one and two centimeter in size, the approach should be individualized according to age, the comorbidities, the type of surgery needed, the tumor growth over time, but also details of imaging and the grading. So what is the actual risk of, uh, of tumor go growth in these small neuroendocrine tumors? Unfortunately, the data that we ca have comes from uh, limited quality studies. It's all retrospective studies. And in this meta-analysis, you can see that the actual risk of tumor growth is, uh, is very low, but also that the size growth per year in the studies that reported that is around 0 0.1 millimeter per year. So it's very, very low. Looking at comparing active surveillance strategies with surgery for these small non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors. We performed a systematic review that was published in 2016, and we combined data from retrospective studies, unfortunately, that had 327 patients undergoing surveillance versus 231 patients who actually had surgery. The problem here is that some studies classified small tumors as lower than four centimeters. But if you look at actually the patients that were observed and did not undergo surgery, mortality rate was 0%. There was no disease-specific mortality rate. And the distant metastases were only found in those patients that had a, a net that was greater than two centimeters. 
So, you know, looking at this data, I know it sounds easy, and we say, okay, it's safe to just uh, surveil a patient and observe, but you know, it's not that easy, and you look in real life, and this was a study published uh, in Germany after the implementation of the 2012 European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society guidelines, saying that it, they would recommend surveillance for the small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but looking at more than 300 patients with this disease characteristics, around 30% were operated in the period after the implementation of the guidelines. Let's look at the data coming from the US. It's even more stunning because if you look at this study coming from the National Cancer Database that includes more than 3,000 patients with small neuroendocrine tumors, you can see that more than 75% of these patients were actually resected. And if you look at the data regarding survival, when you split it and you look at the neuroendocrine tumors that were between one to two centimeters in size, the authors actually state that there is a benefit in resection with uh, reduced overall survival. The problem here is that unfortunately, it's retrospective data and there are some potential biases. First of all, the disease-specific survival was not evaluated and if you look at the patients who, that were put in surveillance, were all older patients. The comorbidities were not evaluated, so it's possible that this mortality will be increased in those elderly patients with comorbidities. But you know, even in our center, where we actually opt for surveillance most of, the, most of the time, when we looked at our data from 2012 to 2017, we found that almost 30% of patients that had a neuroendocrine tumor less than two centimeters underwent resection. So what was the reason for resection? It was not only some features that we can consider of uh, a disease aggressiveness, such as the main pancreatic duct dilation, a, GT, a G2 tumor at the FNA, pre-op FNA, but it's also the patient's preference. And so the discussion that you're gonna have with the patient of keeping a tumor that, yeah, we believe that may be indolent, but psychologically it does have a burden. So I would like to go through some what we call challenging scenarios of what can actually help us decide if we wanna go more towards surgery or opt for active surveillance because there are different characteristics, characteristics and scenarios that we should always take into account. So this is a scenario uh, looking at two young patients. They have the same size neuroendocrine tumors, but one is in the head of the pancreas and the other one is in the tail of the pancreas. They're two young patients. What is actually gonna push me to go one way or the other? If you look at the picture in the left, this tumor is in the head of the pancreas. It would require a Whipple operation. It definitely would require a high-risk anastomosis with a difficult parenchyma, it's a soft pancreas with a small duct, a small bile duct, and definitely high-risk surgery with a high morbidity. On the other end, I, would, I could offer this patient a minimal invasive operation, a distal pancreatectomy that has definitely a lower morbidity. So the location of the tumor can definitely help me decide. This is another scenario that we found in our series. We used to have all patients perform both the gallium dotatate and the uh, uh, glucose PET scan, and we had some patients who actually had a very small tumor, but positivity at the PET scan. So these were patients that we actually pushed to surgery because of the positivity. But look at the results here. Of the 14 patients that had a positive PET scan, actually only a third at final histology had some pathological feature of aggressiveness. This is another common scenario. Sometimes you know you're gonna have a US uh, a guided FNA preoperatively. You have a very small tumor, but you end up having a, a cytology showing a CHI-67 that's uh, greater than 2%. And this is, will guide us towards surgery. But actually, this is highly unreliable, unfortunately, because out of the, it's only four patients that went to surgery in our series, actually only one at final histology had a G2 tumor. Another scenario is when you have a main pancreatic duct dilation. This certainly, although it's a small tumor and less than two centimeter, it is a sign of malignancy. These are what we call the serotoninomas, or the pancreatic carcinoids. And uh, these are often associated with malignancy. So in this series showing uh, eight serotoninomas, you had a quarter of these patients that ended up being metastatic. Finally, another scenario that's pushing towards surgery is when you have a small neuroendocrine tumor, 
that is exophytic. That's, you know, you see it and it's like, oh, I can enucleate this, I can do a pancreatic sparing operation. This certainly guides you through a surgical option because there's no risk of long-term functional complication, but there's still a high risk, obviously, of pancreatic fix fistula. But the mortality rate, the high risk, the high severe morbidities are very low. So I think we still have an unsolved mystery here. Are these incidental small pancreatic neuroendocrine uh, neoplasias just the expression of early diagnosis of an actual disease, or is it more just a clinically irrelevant finding? So as a first step to try to solve this mystery, uh, we designed some years ago a prospective uh, observational trial that is currently ongoing involving uh, 41 uh, hospitals all over the world looking at the different management of these uh, sporadic, uh, non-functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, lower than two centimeter in size. And it's, it's funny that it's called the Aspen study and you know we're in Colorado, so it's a perfect match. But uh, we're, we're going to look at and uh, comparing outcomes and, and quality of life in the patients that actually undergo active surveillance versus uh, surgery. But this, the, the, the type of uh, approach and the management will be decided, it is decided by the physician. It's not a randomized study. So this is just the interim analysis, just to show you the recruitment rate. And so far, we recruited actually more than 700 patients. This is the interim analysis on 500 patients. And you can see that actually it really reflects what we saw also in the retrospective studies. We already had out of 500 patients, 80% that are undergoing surveillance and um, around 20% that were rejected. So hopefully we'll be able to show the outcomes of this study in the next few years. So to summarize, uh, you know, the vast majority of the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors lower than two centimeters in size are considered, can be considered indolent, and really don't be afraid to observe these patients. Uh, we showed you the actual incidence, probably a lot more, and so the burden is, is, is actually very low. Uh, the initial diagnosis is important, but also be careful at all the adjuncts that you're looking at, so if it's the biopsy and the PET, because unfortunately a lot of times they are unreliable. And finally, the decision should always be shared with the patient because there is a burden in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, psychology uh, uh, and having them wait. And finally, always consider pan the uh, patient fitness, the patient characteristics, and not just the nodule and its size. Thank you for your attention.